So, Father, we thank you for your word today. We thank you, Father, that you have plenty of them. Thank you, Father, that we have men and women who, Father, stand before you, come before you, and want to open themselves up to hear your revelations, Lord, and to hear what we need, Father. Thank you, Father, that they do indeed serve you and serve us. So thank you for Howard this day, Father. Let it be filled, overflowing with your Holy Spirit, that your truth, Father, the word that you have given will come forth, Father, as fresh, Father, as you gave it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Microphone working, can you hear me? One, two, one, two. Three, four, three, four. It's on down here. Yeah? Okay, that sounds better. Okay. Good morning, church. How are we doing this morning? I'm going to show you, I sound like a magician. The supernatural is like magic, isn't it? But it's supernatural and it's, uh, it's uh, God's magic. And we're going to talk and uh, look at that this morning. But before we do, could you find a couple of people? And could you say to them, you need to look in the mirror more. <laughs> Come on, find a couple of people. We are going to actually see some videos, um, and uh, uh, they're very special videos, uh, which you'll appreciate when you see them. Just to just to introduce why you're going to see these videos. Um, sometime before lockdown, so bef before 2020, 2019, the Lord gave a word for this church, and He said this church would be a crescent. Now, um, the word crescent means a kind of torch. But it was the kind of torch that, uh, and I think of medieval times, that we would be left burning permanently on the outside of a church or some building in a town so that people could go there and take fire home. That they would light their own torch, it would always be burning, and they could, and they could take the fire home. And we've seen over the last uh, uh, least couple of years how that prophetic word has been coming true. Um, look at the youth last week. Um, Actually, the word for the youth was cross-pollination. It wasn't just the fire going out from here, it was fire coming in as well from another church. When we go out and ask churches to come and worship with us together, I see that as part of the Crescent vision of taking something from here out but of course, we receive as well. It's not that uh, uh, only the arts got this or anything like that, no. We're all working for the kingdom. But one of the areas where I think we have seen flame going out is with the deliverance ministry here in the, in the church. And um, God said to the pastor, start a deliverance ministry in the church. 
that was in, well, we started in May or June 2021. So it's been going for two, two and a, uh, a bit years. And in that time, something like 150, between 150 and 200 people have received deliverance. And I'll explain what, what I mean by that. But I just want to finish with the crescent uh, word. If you're going to be a crescent, your fire must never go out. You have to keep your fire burning. Otherwise, you're not a crescent. People will come wanting fire, and they're not going to get it. So in the ark, we all have a responsibility to keep that fire burning not only for our own sake, but for the sake of others. And the other thing is, if you're going to be a crescent, you need to burn brightly. You've got to burn brightly. So in the darkest of times, when someone needs their own light, their own fire, they can locate it and find it. We have to be that kind of crescent. <coughs> now within the ark, within the church, there's plenty of people who've received deliverance. Deliverance meaning liberation, chains being broken, being set free spiritually, curses over your life broken. Any satanic influence over your life finished. And when that happens, signs, wonders, and miracles are seen. But you can still be in the ark and be sitting back and saying, well, yeah, that's for them, not, not for me. I don't need that. Or you can be saying, yeah, but, but I, I might have to confess a few things I don't want to have to confess. Well, God knows everything, everything. Or maybe, yeah, but it would mean that person, I'm not so keen on that person. Come on, come on, God needs to do his work. God wants to do his work. God wants to set you free. And what happened to Jesus when he went back to his own hometown? What happened to him? All he could do was just a few healings and then he left because he wasn't accepted. There wasn't sufficient faith in him for him to do all the miracles that he wanted. And it says in Mark 5, Mark 6, a prophet is not without honour, except in his hometown. So in some ways, familiarity can, can bring a lack of faith, can actually lower your faith. Let's not let that happen. Let's keep it up there. Let's keep our faith right up there. When people come for deliverance, the process is actually quite simple. We have a kind of method, but the Lord sometimes says, no, don't do that, do that, or do that, or do that, and we just follow what the Holy Spirit says. But basically, we take away every legal reason that Satan has to punish you. We take away and destroy all the curses that have come down through the generations that are not your fault at all, but have come through the bloodline onto you. We identify them, we pray and we break them. And we, we are Christians, the Holy Spirit lives within us. Yes, but we can still come under demonic influence. We see that so many times, so many times. And we take away all legality, 
the enemy has no reason to, to oppress you, and it ends. And I'm going to show you on these videos what happens when we do that. And you know, we often pray for healing, and we're praying that the prayer will, will be answered, but it's not science, it's not mathematics. Sometimes there's healing, sometimes there's not. We, we need to reflect on why, why not? But I can tell you with deliverance, the Lord does not fail us. The Lord does not fail us. There was someone here came for a visit, mother of one of the church members, came for a visit from, from Lagos. She's retired, but had a knee that was causing her mobility problems. And she, she didn't want to face retirement immobile, because this knee was a real problem. And she came, and her family here said, go for deliverance. She came for deliverance in absolute faith. And when she came, she remembered a prophecy over her life, which was, one day, some white folk are going to pray for you. I thought that was beautiful. And she remembered that, and she took hold of that. And we went through deliverance, and she, she was wonderful, absolutely wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And now she walks like me. That's what God can do. That's what he can do. So let's see, I'm going to show you three videos, okay? Now the first video is three, three and a half minutes long, and I'm not going to say anything more about it than it's a testimony to what happened. Now just one thing I do want to say is that we never undervalue the prayers of people outside the deliverance process, outside the deliverance room. This first person, Doris, was receiving a lot of prayer, and that prayer was important. It wasn't just, oh no, it was deliverance. It was a, a process that involved all the prayer she received. Everything that happened. It just so happened there was a, a defining moment during the deliverance. Okay, can we have the first video? Please, Louise. Can you put the volume up, Michael? Can we turn it up? What kind of news? And so, we kind of... Father, you have cancer? Cancer from the nose? I don't know the name of the Spanish, they call it anyway. Mm -hmm. So, when you said that word, I just said, what God cannot do does not exist. I say, I reject it, it's not my portion. The radiotherapy, you know? It's just a machine, you, you enter and like about 20 minutes or thereabouts, mm -hmm. you come out. You, you, know, you don't feel any pain and nothing there. It was killing me, like killing me something. Yeah, yeah. I had like all my hair started falling off yeah. gradually, gradually then I started losing my 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 throat, my my uh, my throat, I can't like all go like bones, mm. you know, like I can't swallow, I can't even swallow water or anything liquid. Mm. Then I was telling the doctors, I'm no more coming, I'm done with it. Ah. And the doctor said, Oh no, Doris, you are too young. You just have to finish it. I said, I can't eat anymore. I can't. I can't take anything. But before then, you know, the ministers of God, <laughs> they paid me a visit and they said, Doris, we will pray with you. It's a prayer of deliverance. 
you know? So they came, and the day they came to pray with me, like uh, the power of God, like it was so awesome there. You know, they, like the things I was not able to be doing on that day, like, like all my body was just vibrating when the prayer was going on. You know, so I saw myself doing some things that I was not doing for some time. So I know that uh, God, God is present, His power was present, and and He has already healed me. Yeah. Then the, when the time for me to go to Costa de Sol to see my doctor, and when I got there, before, like he was looking at me and he was just smiling. Me too, I was smiling. And he said, Doris, you have a good news. I said, I know, you know, like, I, I know. And he said, you, you don't have anything, uh, there's no cancer anymore. You know, nothing, nothing. Everything you are here, everything is fine. I was just laughing. I said, God has done it because I know. I visit me and he tell me, he minister to me in my dream and said it's finished. Yes. So I believe when he said it's finished, it's finished, it's finished. Amen. 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 What, a, what, what an amazing God we serve, you know? If we're fit and healthy, sometimes it's easy to, to forget what it must be like for a person who lives with, with some kind of disability, uh, something that every day of their lives they're, they're thinking, how long is this going to go on? What's, you know, if, if, if you live in a wheelchair or you have to have crutches to walk around, can you imagine what, what your life is like? And then can you imagine what it feels like? when God touches you and miraculously you can suddenly start walking? Well, I'm going to show you a video now. It's 40 seconds long. And it's a lady who has spent 13 years in a wheelchair or walking with, with crutches with great difficulty. And this is, um, these are not her first steps, these are her second steps. The first step she took, she was drunk, <laughs> she was like this, these legs hadn't been used for 13 years. But then, this is her, her second set of steps. This is what God will do. Can we have the <laughs> second video? Jesus is so proud of you. Yes. He's so proud of you. I don't know what's going to do. I don't know what's going to do. I've been able to sidestep. Like... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Tears of joy uh, when you 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 see what uh, what that baby uh, uh, can now do, thanks to the Lord. It has nothing to do with us. It is everything, everything to do with Him. Now the last video is actually this lady, Rachel, giving her testimony to her church. And she talks about her life and, and then a little bit about what happened. 
It's seven minutes long, but I think it's worth watching because it brings home all the glory of God. And I repeat, it is all to do with him. All to do with him. So let's watch this one. In Jesus' name. Amen. So I am going to invite Rachel to come up. Um, Rachel's got a, a, a testament to share. I'm not going to say any more than that. I'm going to just let Rachel share this. Um, yeah, let <laughs> it speak for itself. I'm going to stand up on the step because I can. <laughs> Please bear with me, an emotional neck. <laughs> um, so not everybody here um, knows me very well, I'm still quite new to the church. Those who know me know me walking with a stick or having my wheelchair. Um, some people know me as missing church for months at a time because I can't get out of bed. Um, I'm going to read it because it makes more sense when I read it. So 13 years ago, I was diagnosed with a lifelong neurological condition that affected my mobility. I was in constant pain and had reduced sensations all over my body. When I first became ill, my family were told to make their peace with me and to say their goodbyes, but God had other plans, thank goodness. And I pulled through, and although I was told that I would never be able to walk, I managed to get some of that mobility back. I was brought up in a very loving Christian home, and over the years I've been close to God, and there's been times when I've not been very close to Him too, but I've always known that He's, he's by my side and He's always had hold of me. Even in the darkest moments through the illness, I was being held up in prayer by so many, by my, my, my friends, my family, my church, over the past 13 years, there have been times when the illness has caused me to spend weeks or months in hospital. I've had to learn to walk again, twice. The other times, the illness has been more stable and I've been able to manage walking short distances using my crutch or needing my wheelchair. I've had a cocktail of heavy duty painkillers that have never quite cut it. I've always had pain. At the beginning of my journey of being poorly, I believed that healing was possible, absolutely. I had absolute faith that Jesus would heal me um, physically. At that time, all I received, I say all I received, I don't mean all, what I received was a lot of spiritual and um, emotional healing. Um, I thought that physical healing was for other people. Um, I felt a lot of pain and loneliness where I was, um, but I knew that God was using me in that situation, wherever I was, to reach people through my illness, and that the loneliness was just my thing to bear. I never doubted that God was there. I always knew He was, and that He wanted the best for me, that He loved me, and He sustained me in all the difficult times. What the exciting bit. Three weeks ago, Nick and I took the children on holiday to Spain. Over the course of the first week, my health was really quite bad. Usually I'm quite well in here, um, but I was experiencing a lot of pain and a huge amount of frustration at what I couldn't do, all the fun things that the family were doing. The last Sunday, a week ago, we went to church in Malaga and I felt God minister me to, to me from the moment I got up that morning and through the worship and the sermon. And I spent most of the service crying into the wall because I was so embarrassed and didn't want anybody to see. Um, at the end of the service, a man came straight up to me and he said, God's told me to pray for you. Obviously, I said, thank you, that would be lovely. But I was a bit sceptical. I've been to healing ministries before and I've never received physical healing. So this gentleman, Howard, and the lady called Anne, talked to me about the deliverance ministry that they have within the church. 
and they prayed for an hour and a half. <coughs> we covered covering um, forgiveness of sins, the release from spiritual bonds. Um, it was a, a very deep prayer. There's too much to, to tell, really. Um, when they started praying, I was, like I said, I was skeptical about the process, but the prayer went on, and I knew that God was forgiving me as the prayer happened, and I was feeling lighter and brighter, and my load was just lifting. As the prayer came to an end, Howard invited the Holy Spirit to, to come into my body to make sure that they hadn't missed anything, and I felt a hot whoosh of wind travel down. I had no, I had, I had no sensation in my legs, and I felt it zip in and out, all down my right leg and back up my left. And I, need, and I knew I needed to get up. I needed to, to stand. When I stood up, I realised for the thir first time in 13 years, I had no pain. Nothing. I knew that God had miraculously healed this condition that was supposed to be with me until my dying day. Despite Nick running over with my crutch when he saw me stand up, and, and Anne, who had just prayed for me, standing in front of me saying, just hold on, take a breath, slow down. I said, listen, Anne, I don't know you. I love you, but get out of my way. <laughs> <laughs> and I took, I started walking. I walked up and down the church. There's even a video of me knocking my knees together within minutes of, of walking unaided for the first time in 13 years. When I got home, I jumped in the pool where the kids were, dive bombed them, fully clothed, and I touched Harley's face for the first time since she was three months old, and I thought, oh, God is so good. And this morning's service is so apt about having faith and not giving up. And it's all been said in the songs of the worship and, and what we've been preaching this morning. God is good and just have faith is bigger than anything that we think we can't deal with. She said there that um, God was forgiving her, and as he was forgiving her, she felt a weight lifting off herself. Let's just remember that. Let's just remember that. Confessing what we perhaps don't want to confess, we're actually doing ourselves a favour, because we lift a weight off ourselves, because God will forgive you. My message this morning, um, uh, I just want to give another couple of details about what happened that day, because it's for learning, for learning. It's nothing to do with, with, with me, us, uh, personally, but how God works. That day, um, we were coming into church through the front door down on the roundabout and before the service, service I started praying and I knew the Lord wanted me to pray at the entrance just, just here, this entrance to, to here and so I started praying in tongues I was just walking backwards and forwards and I felt the Lord saying keep praying, keep praying, keep praying, keep praying and then he said to me go and get Norman Norman's not here today. Norman was actually praying in a room down there and to bring his shofar. You know, Norman blows the shofar, uh, the horn, excuse me. <clears throat> Norman came with his shofar and he blew it. And I felt <clears throat> a spiritual cleansing rush through the building. It was very strong, very strong that day. The service started and we were doing praise and worship. Mike was leading praise and worship. And just after the, the offering, second song, I felt the Lord saying, get on your knees. 
So I said, okay, and I was on my knees there, and I just started praying in tongues again. I just started praying, 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 praying. And I think I was quite loud. I don't know if I disturbed anybody that day. Uh, or, uh, I noticed Marissa moved. Was it because of me? <laughs> it probably was. I was getting carried away, but the Spirit, the Spirit was, was pushing me on. And at one point, I said to the Spirit, I said, my knees are killing me. And he said, well, get on your face then. That was the answer. Don't stop praying, just get on your face. Lie down flat, it doesn't matter. Keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. So I kept praying till the end of praise and worship. And then the Lord said, okay, you can, you can stand up now. And then during, during the, uh, the rest of the service, um, I knew that uh, Rachel, uh, we were gonna pray for Rachel. My point is, prayer works. <laughs> My point is, obedience, getting closer to him, praying works. And that is the, the proof of that with Rachel. And she came, she said she was a little bit skeptical, but she came willing, willing to open herself to God and ask for forgiveness. And now her life is completely different. She actually said, I'm really looking forward to having to queue in the airport and to have to look for parking spaces. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, but why? Why is that happening? Why, why can we go to God in that way and he respond in that way? Well, you know, when Jesus died on the cross, the veil was split, wasn't it? The veil that veiled the holy of holy in the in the temple that only one priest was allowed was allowed in you were not allowed in it was protected by the by the veil and when jesus died he took away that veil he took it away so that we can have access to him and not only did he say you can have access to me but I give you promises. And when you follow his word in obedience, he keeps all the promises. In 2 Corinthians, if we could just put this up please Louis, 2 Corinthians 3, verses 16 to 18, it says this, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. When you come to Jesus, when you say, Jesus, I believe in what you did. I want you to be my saviour. The veil is taken away. And you have access to all these things we're talking about today. Verse 17 says, now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is is freedom. The Spirit brings freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. In your walk with Jesus are you advancing? Are you becoming more like Jesus? It's a big question, isn't it? And that's between you, you and the Lord. But you can be transformed into his likeness. That was the promise, and that was why the, the veil split, and we have the new covenant. In Corinthians as well, it explains how, how Moses, who went before the Lord on the mountain, then had to put on a veil because the glory of the Lord was reflected so brightly in his face and he had to wear a veil until it wore off a bit. And it's kind of the opposite, isn't it? It's kind of the opposite. Moses had to put his veil on. But Jesus has taken it off for us. There is no veil there. Okay, now at the beginning, I said to you, 
to say something to people that they needed to look more in the mirror. Let's just understand why, why I said that. Let's have a look. Now, first of all, first of all, can you put your hand up if you spend less than a minute looking in the mirror in the mornings? Okay? Hands down. Can you put your hand up if you spend more than a minute looking at yourself in the mirror in the mornings? Well, that's all women except Mike and Fashik. Okay. So, so, let's look at James chapter 1. Let's look at James chapter 1, 22 to 25. You both look wonderful. <laughs> Let's have a look at James. Now, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror. It says like a man who looks at himself in a mirror. And after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. In other words, when you read the Bible, when you read the Word, don't just read it, close the book, and forget it, just like you do with the mirror in the mornings. You look in the mirror, look all right, yeah, I'm fine, and off you go, and you forget about that image. Spend time contemplating and understanding the Word of God. Now, the reason I'm saying this, and relating this to those miracles that we've seen, is because you're part of it. If you're part of the ark, you're part of that. You may not be the person sitting in front of somebody in a wheelchair praying for them, but your prayers, your prayers for the church leaders, for the church, for deliverance ministry, they all count. Your prayers count. Carol has asked for prayer this morning because she knows prayer works. If you go to the Lord in humility and you pray to him, he hears it. He hears you. So, understanding more about how God works through his word, reading his word, understanding his word, chewing on that and praying, you will help the, all the ministries in the church. You're helping each other. So you have your role. Okay, now, today we're in September. Do you know that we're in the middle of Teshuvah? We're in the middle of Teshuvah. What's Teshuvah? Teshuvah is the month of Elul in the Hebrew calendar. And Teshuvah is the period of time between the uh, festival of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur, as we know, which is going to come on the 24th of September, is the Day of Atonement, is the celebration of the Day of Atonement. Now, for the Jewish nation, this month of Elul is Teshuvah. And Teshuvah, the word actually means to return, to go back. In Psalm 51, David is calling out to the Lord and regretting his sin with Bathsheba, with uh, Bas uh, Bathsheba, sorry. And he's regretting that, and it's a, a psalm of lament. And what he's asking for is, he's asking to return, to return to the place he was before he sinned. So this is a time building up to Yom Kippur when we as well can reflect just like Rachel reflected and confessed and went before the Lord and reaped the benefit. It's a time for us to do that. And we can let the Spirit show us where we need to repent, forgive, show us our pride, show us our anger, and show us all the rubbish we need to get rid of. 
That's what um, Teshuvah is all, is all about. It's about four things, just to make it simple. Recognising our wrongs. Facing up to the fact that we're not perfect, that we get things wrong at times, and recognising it. Regretting it. One thing is to recognise it, another is to regret it with godly sorrow. With godly sorrow. Resolve to change. Then resolve to change. Take a decision. I am going to stop doing that. And those decisions are powerful. They're very, very powerful. And then refrain from going wherever it was you went and not put yourself in temptation again. Recognise, regret, resolve, refrain. It's a great formula. It's a great formula. I just want to look at one Bible verse, uh, 2 Corinthians 7.10, just to reinforce that point about godly sorrow. Could you put that up, uh, Louise? Thank you. It says, godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Meaning spiritual death. Nobody in deliverance has said afterwards, oh, I wish I hadn't confessed that. No one. No one. In fact, people usually say, wow, this feels lighter. It feels better. That's why now, to finish, I'm going to ask you to look in the mirror. And I'm going to ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. We're going to put on a song quite low, which is called a song of repentance. And while in the four minutes that this song is playing, I ask you to come before the Lord. Stay in your seat. If you want to kneel or whatever you want to do, whatever the Lord says, that's up to you. We're just going to put this on softly. I'm just going to let the Holy Spirit minister to you and show you anything in your life. If there is something that's revealed to you, unforgiveness, or an unconfessed sin, whisper it so that only you can hear, no one else wants to hear, but just whisper it. Whisper it. Lord, I wish to repent of the sin of constant anger. That's between you and him. But saying it out loud, on your breath, has an effect. Lord, I forgive that person. If you've got unforgiveness in your heart, get it out now. Do yourself a favour. Forgive, and you will feel better. Okay? Let's just come before the Lord for these four minutes. Thank you, Louise.